Margaret Riley, our old and dear friends, young and dear friends. And uh, I just wondered, um, uh, that Dr. Riley and Margaret were pastor and pastor wife in Paris. And uh, Margaret, could you give me the details of the year you came? Was it 1950? Yes. In, in the fall of 1950, maybe November? I think so. Maybe October. I think maybe it was September, October of 1950. And then we were there until the 1st of July of 56. And you had uh, three children? And then had three children when we came, had another one after we were there. And then you left Paris and came to Second Baptist Houston? Right. And, how long and we, we were there for a little over 20 years. And then James uh, became a professor at Houston Baptist University. And when he became a professor, I became a travel agent. <laughs> and uh, then he was at Houston Baptist for 12 years. And then he, it, he was caught in the compulsory retirement. So he's been retired since then. Yes, it was in this case, I thought. I think so. I think that definitely would have been in your case. Oh, um, Brother Jim, I know you were went to school in Tennessee. Were you born in Tennessee? Born in Memphis, in Tennessee. Memphis. Mm -hmm. And then went to school in Jackson. Didn't you? Went to school in Jackson, Tennessee. Baptist school. Right. Union University. Union University, that's right. And where did you go to seminary? Southwestern in Fort Worth. Okay. Forever. <laughs> Where did you meet Margaret? Well, she was a member of my church when I was pastor of a church on the outskirts of Memphis, oh. uh, White Station that's now inside the city, a little church, Eudora Baptist Church. Her father was, uh, he was about the only deacon, <laughs> really. Oh, no, he wasn't. Well, he was the main deacon anyway. <laughs> but I went there to be pastor. Um, I think the reason that they called me, though I was not married, was that I had a family. My mother and brother and sister lived with me. My sister had mar did marry soon, and, but my mother and brother lived with me, and we lived in the pastor's home at Eudora Baptist Church. And uh, her family members there, she was a member there, and... Uh, that's the only person I ever dated who was a member of my church. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. So we were married then in 1942, and uh, I finished the seminary in 44, my first degree. And I stayed and worked on my doctorate and uh, ultimately got it. <laughs> but uh, we've had a good time. I came to Houston in 1944. 56, what is it? Yes. 1956, after I'd been pastor at uh, church in Paris, and it was Second Baptist Church here, and they called me as pastor, and uh, so I finished my pastoral career there. And uh, <clears throat> let's see, I was there 20? Just a little over 20 years. As pastor, and then I joined the faculty at Houston Baptist University, and from there I finally retired when I reached retirement age. Um, but I taught there for about 12, 12 years at Houston Baptist University, and interestingly, I had been on the committee that started the university, oh, and I was chairman of the committee when I was pastor at Second whose task was to procure the first president. So we got a man from Texarkana, a junior college president there, and he came, W.H. Hinton, and uh, he served remarkably well as president of Houston Baptist University. But uh, our life in Houston has just been built around Second Baptist Church and then my experiences uh, at Houston Baptist University as a faculty member. And uh, finally I retired and 
She's been putting up with me ever <laughs> since. <laughs> That's Fort what we Bend. live in, Fort Bend, Fort Bend County. That's right. Uh, well, of course, our relation with you all was covered that six years that you were in Paris, and it was such an important six years in the life of our church because you did so many things for the church and led out in so many ways. Um, I was in Baylor when you came. I was not there when you came in 1950, but Mother was on the pastor search committee, I think we called it pulpit committee then, that you all came from Wilkes Point. And uh, did you move into the parsonage that was on the church grounds then? No. No, you had, no had, the Revises were the first ones to live in the parsonage that, on, on Main Street, that's right. so, South Main. So you lived there. That's where we lived, yes. Yeah. And the old parsonage was Sunday school space. And it was there the whole time that you were there, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Now, you also were responsible for building the nursery yeah. building. Yeah, uh, I guess that was the first large uh, building addition that had been done there in quite a while. But we built that educational wing back there. And it has been such a good building. I know uh, we've had to do a lot of... of uh, work on the older buildings, but this, that building. That was a real good building. It's a that, remarkably uh, built building, and it, it, it even passes most of the safety codes today, you know, which our, of course, our old buildings don't, yeah. but it does with the concrete building blocks, fireproof, and the way the stairwells are built and all. It was certainly a well-built building, and it's almost 50 years now, you know, and is doing, it's still the new educational <laughs> building, you know. Yeah. But that's uh, one that, uh, and we got to no longer have any temporary buildings around, I think, when that uh, building was built. Right. That was, and now the Rubles lived in a house, what, between the church and that building? Back on 3rd Street. On 3rd. Across 3rd. No, same side well, as 3rd. It was on that same side. As the church. As the back of the church. Between us and the Presbyterians. Right. Okay. Earl Rubel and James Riley. James Riley and Earl Rubel were such a remarkable duo. I won't say like Batman and Robin, <laughs> but they, uh, you all just did everything. I mean, you were pastor, preacher, exemplary, and he was Mr. Music and Education, yeah. and Aline played the yeah. organ. And, uh, yeah. She was a wonderful musician. She was. Yeah, she really was. But um, all Earl Rubel needed was somebody to control him. <laughs> but he, he had a lot of ability. And he truly did. And, uh, and he and I worked together beautifully. We just, as far as I know, I went to a convention one time and I came back and somebody had written on a blackboard uh, in the educational building, here lie the bones of Earl G. Rubel. They buried him today. He lived the life of Riley while Riley was away. <laughs> Somebody had written that on a blackboard, and so that greeted me when I came back. Well, so. he, um, he did education and music. Yes, he was a combination. And uh, do you remember how many we were running in Sunday school then? Ooh, heavens. Uh, you remember? Well, it seems to me like... It was about eleven hundred, but it was it was above thousands that we were running in the Sunday school, and uh, we had two or three of those special drives where we got over twelve hundred present. But uh, and of course, one of the main things that uh, I remember about that church was the number of missions we had. We had four missions around the city and so the church was really ministering at uh, to every community that was uh, then a part of the uh, Paris I suppose you would call it the Paris layout right. <clears throat> and but it was a good church and we had some wonderful people I just uh, the church meant more to me <laughs> than I could ever have meant to the church oh. because uh, well, they meant a lot to me because they they took me with a lot of little green 
sprouts and ripened me a good bit. <laughs> so, uh, but I remember it very fondly. It was a, a great experience there. Well, it's just almost unbelievable to me to think that we were running over a thousand in Sunday school with just two staff members. And I know. Uh, we now have about 750 in Sunday school on campus and have yeah. six staff members. Well, uh, there, there are more churches, aren't there? Right. Yeah, out around. So that we were drawing people to Sunday school at First Church who are now serving in, right, in churches out, which was a good thing. And I think one of the most impressive things about uh, that I recall from my ministry was our missions. At Spring Lake, different places, we had these missions out uh, out Bonham Street, out this way, and that was a real good ministry. And uh, they had some people there who had remarkable talents and abilities in planning. Dorsey Mackey was one possibly the uh, brightest guy that we had in the church, but there were several others of equal or almost equal ability. And uh, But the church spread out with those missions, and uh, I wouldn't take anything from our years there. It was just... Well, we really ministered, as you say, there was one in North Paris, and there was one on Graham Street, and there was one on the south yeah. side of town, and then one on Spring Lake, and then Spring Lake. one that you started that was... Uh, by the housing development, yeah, which um, did real well for a while. It was over there on Seventh Street, and uh, we had those all those missions, and then all of the. I mean, our, we really did minister to that city. It was uh, those were good years. It was a good ministry. Uh, I don't suppose that I could recall any instant when we had a serious problem. I mean, disagreement or anything. It was very harmonious, and uh, we had good staff. They were all good. Not as many now as uh, then as you have now imagined at the church, but uh, it was a good spirit, a good attitude, and uh, as far as I know, there was no uh, great dissident voice within the congregation and certainly there was no division. Uh, it was a, a real good good thing. Uh, the former pastors had done a great job. And uh, I was the beneficiary <laughs> of a lot of their efforts through the years. Old Dr. Wright and others. Uh, Rebus. Yes. These others made a remarkable contribution. So. such a builder. And uh, I don't mean just a building, but a, a I know. Church. Promoter. And at the youth program in the meet because I was in high school when he came. Yeah, I know that. He was, he was, uh, he was a remarkable pastor. Mm -hmm. He really was. But you, uh, you were also a very remarkable preacher. Well, my main strength was pulpit. Well. Whereas Rebus's great strength lay in uh, other areas, just as important, maybe even more important. But. Uh, my strong point was pulpit, I know that. And yet we had a good staff. We were able to to have Earl Rubel. I never will. He was remarkable, and so was his wife. I went to a convention and came back, and somebody had written up on a board. You told him that. <laughs> Did I tell you that? Here lies the bones of Earl G. Rubel. Yeah. Well, he lived a life of Riley. That's something else. He lived a life of Riley. Well, Riley was away. But... Uh, all in all, it was a joyous and happy time well, we, for I us. I remember so well your sermons, and I still think you're the finest preacher I've ever heard. I well, that's kind. Uh, I remember a series you did on the Ten Commandments, <laughs> and when you got to the one on Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, I remember your three points of the ways that if we take... And it's not written down anywhere, because if it were it, it written down, it's sure not the same Bible I still use. It's written in here. The three ways that we take God's name in vain is abuse, abusing his name, misuse, using it wrongly, and disuse, not using it at all. Yeah. I'd say you have a remarkable memory. <laughs> you sure do. Uh. And, uh, he, uh, but you were such a fine pulpit. 
here, and we just, the people grew. And as you say, we just had a wonderful spirit in the church. Well, it was a good, it was a good experience. I, I really enjoyed it. And well, Margaret, you were an ideal pastor's wife, as oh. was your predecessor, Dr. Mabel Revis. And uh, I just wonder if you had any particularly, particular memory, memories of, uh, of being there. Well, you've already mentioned some of the people that you thought, that hmm. you thought so much of. Right. Um, I remember Roma Robinson. Or is it Robertson? Robinson. Ro Robinson. Robinson. She ran the nursery business. Yes, she did. I don't mean ran it, but she was in she charge. She was in charge yeah. of it. And and she was outstanding. <coughs> I think mean, she was uh, offered a south-wide position or something later, uh, something at the seminary maybe. But uh, I, I remember when Jan was born, she started the baby of the day. And there was a went up. Uh, window in the nursery and the first time a new baby came to church the crib was put there in the window and everybody could come and see the baby of the day and Jan was the first baby of the day. <laughs> oh. Now that was in the new, was that in the new nursery building? No, that was, that was in the old building. Now the nursery was on the second floor. It was there mm -hmm. very near the offices. Mm -hmm. The first floor on the second floor? On the second, no, second floor. floor. Uh -huh. and, and then uh, James's office and the library were up on the third floor. Was I his think. office in the corner up on the third mm -hmm. floor, kind of when you went up there? Because my Sunday school department was up there. And it seems like when I was in high school that we had to, I guess that was when Dr. Evans was there, that we had, were so crowded, that was before the new building was built, that we had to meet in the pastor study. I think my class met in the pastor study, and it was in that corner room on the third floor. But the offices are now on the first floor of that building. And, uh, <laughs> that, so I was thinking that the nursery was on the second yeah. floor. And, and we had an outstanding library. Ms. Pomeroy was the librarian. And I enjoyed working in the library. And she even went to um, school over in Commerce and got her degree in library science. And she really ran that library. I remember Will Sailors was yeah. on the library committee, and she made us do shelf reading and <laughs> besides processing books. Oh, wow, yes, well, we've got, and that's something, back then it wasn't as common for churches to have libraries. Right. Was, who was the church hostess then? I know at one time later um, was, but. Uh, oh, and that lady has some family here in Houston now. Her name started with a C. Cozart. Cozart. Ms. Cozart was the church hostess. Because I knew that was an important part, because Baptists meet, greet, and eat. Right. And that was important. Uh, what about the youth program? Do you all remember? I was, as I said, in college when you all came, so I wasn't as, I don't remember the youth program as much as I do under Dr. Well, the main thing I remember about the youth program is that at that time the WMU had a youth director in charge of all the auxiliaries. And and I think maybe Adelaide Springer was the WMU president, but I was the youth director. So you were in charge of all that? So I was in charge of all of that. Well, now, at, weren't we, now, didn't we back up a little bit with that old apartment? I think we were using it for Sunday school space. Do you all remember Martha St. Clair? Was she there when you were on the No, she was not there. Okay. I guess she had left. I think she was there when Dr. Revis was there, maybe, and then she left, I guess. Because I remembered her, but I didn't remember yeah, that. We, we heard a lot about Martha St. Clair, but she was not there when we were there. Well, now, did, did Earl Rubel come shortly after you? Yeah, he, we got him to, he was from Greenville. He, uh, he was the First Baptist Church First in Greenville, Greenville. and uh, I don't know what kind of insanity struck me, but <laughs> some kind of serious attack, <laughs> and I got hold of Earl and got him to come to our church. I'm kidding, of course, because he was, 
But uh, but he was there basically the whole time. He really there. was. Uh, Earl had a lot of good qualities. Uh, he was not an outstanding musician. He was not an outstanding educator. But he did both competently. Yes. And uh, the people liked him. Right. And uh, he was just crazy enough that he could get along with a choir. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> It takes a certain amount of insanity. Yes, I think you're right. Yes, I am. But old Earl just smoked, well, you know. And, uh, but he was a strong, strong supporter. And he did education and music. You know, and this was a pretty big assignment up there. And we had some real good programs with the missions, you know, all around. And, uh, did we have two morning services when you were there? Where? We did part of the time. I was going to say, if you had 600 in there, it looked crowded. If you had 650 in there, it was crowded. It was really. The thing I, one of the things I remember with such fondness was, particularly on Sunday nights, and this was before air conditioning, we had these ceiling fans on the deep pole. Yeah. <laughs> on, on the hot summer evening, you remember Margaret with the windows, those beautiful stained glass right. windows open, and we'd cluster under the ceiling fan. It was probably about 98 at least. <laughs> when, and I know we had a lot of, we had revivals regularly, and uh, well, they were usually in the church, weren't they? I don't think they out there, did the outside revival. One, one time we had Eddie Martin. <gasps> Three weeks at the Fair Park, wasn't right. it? Right. Yeah. But most of the time they were in the Most of the time we had to just really right within there. <clears throat> that was one of the most remarkable revivals I ever remember. Seems like, wasn't it at Fair Park? Yes, it was. It seems like it went about three weeks. That was, that was something else. Okay. Well, we And we um, had the supper at my grandmother Williams' house on Clarksville Street. And you had to leave early to go to church for a revival. And uh, we had ham, which I know was your favorite meat. And I still remember as you walked out the door, you picked up a piece of ham. Like, <laughs> that sounds like me. Oh, we were, you, you were such a loved pastor. You said that your strongest point was your preaching, but you were also a very wonderful pastor and very loved for things like that. Well, I followed, what's his name? Revis. Revis. Yeah, Revis. And uh, I was so different from Revis that it gave me a little advantage uh, in some ways. But I really enjoyed the whole thing and the whole time. Well, our church has been so fortunate to have such wonderful preachers that are. I mean, Dr. Buckner, we were commenting on the fact that the Kendalls live in a Buckner village. And Dr. Buckner was pastor in Paris in 1870. I know. He passed the hat to start right. with Mark and And my, my mother's granddaddy Ratliff was one of the 28 that put in a dollar. And you just think how that is, what is the largest private? Oh. Well, in many ways, that was the birthplace of Buckner. It orphanages. Was, that, yeah. Passing the hat there was the, yeah, was the it was. beginning. <clears throat> and it's just been a, it, that church has such a, such a rich heritage. And that's why we think that every pastor this century has, this past century has, you know, contributed so much. Um, let's see, Margaret, can you think of anything particularly that I have left out? I talked about, oh, the women's Oh yes, it it was very active. Um, I can't remember except that that the WMU house party started while we were in Paris, you know, and we all would go to the house party and 
attend all those things and come back and do everything that was recommended. Everything they said. Yeah. Of course, it was so different then when most women did not work outside That's right. the home. Because when mothers started having to work outside the home, it made such a difference. But we did have two night circles right. even then. Because there were still people mm -hmm. being, I mean, there were people even then that were working outside the home. And of course, that added so much to the mission emphasis. And the church always, we gave what? 15, 20% to the cooperative program then, I think? I think we gave 50%. Up oh, pretty much. I mean, well, of course, one reason we could do 50% because we had the local missions. So after that was included, of course, that, was that would include the local missions, so we, but that's valid. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Well, that thing in, out in north part of Paris was really, you remember Blake Dunnigan? Oh, yes. Yeah, really? Oh, he Blake was one was, of the mission pastors. Huh? He was at Spring Lake, wasn't he? He was. Yes, that's where he was. I think he was at Spring Lake, but he and I graduated from Paris High together in '48. Yeah. And, uh, he was he was single then, and uh, at one point he dated James's secretary, Nellie Faye Smith. Margaret Harris. No, no uh, Nellie Faye Smith. Yeah, yeah. Who came from Will's Point? From somewhere near Will's Point to Paris. I don't remember. Uh, I think I and and she had some kind of illness, uh, and I don't know. Is Blake? Do you recall who Blake Dunnigan married? He was back for our class reunion three years ago. We had our fiftieth, but I don't believe his wife came with him. Mm -hmm. And you remember Helen Carpenter was the organist when we were there, the Crane's daughter. Yes, yes. I had forgotten that she was our organist, John and Wilma Crane. Right. And it was their house. On this That's right, apartment. that had been their house. And Helen had married Eddie Carpenter. I had forgotten that she was our organist. <laughs> was um, Fetus Williams, did she ever play the piano with him? Uh, I don't recall her playing in church. Lois Kendall said that Thetis had led the music when Dr. Wright was here, or played the organ and led the choir. And I just didn't remember. I think Thetis is still living. I think she's 101 or 102. Really? And, but I don't, uh, I don't remember how long she played in church. It seems like I remember her playing the piano in the old sanctuary some, but I don't know, you know, during his past. And we, what was the occasion when we were back? I think maybe you all were without a pastor. And Roy Moody was the one responsible for James coming that time and preaching on Sunday. I don't remember when that was. Mm. You mean like 10 years ago? Or longer than that? Longer than that, I think. You were with us when we went back that time. And you said you said Brian was I think so. I think so. So it was thirteen or fourteen years ago. Well now Dr. Stipple was there twenty five years and he left in December of ninety of eighty eight. And uh, so it would have been after that. Right after he left. Right. I bet that was when it was. Well, we, uh, and then the, um, we had dinner with the Briggs. The Briggs had been members of Second Church and went back to Paris. Eula and uh, Homer. Homer. Yes. I had forgotten that. He and my daddy were good friends. My daddy had been gone ten and a half years, but now, of course, Homer was younger than my daddy. And then they kind of adopted a young doctor who grew up in the church. Who would that be? What, who was that? I can't remember that now. Oh, I know who you mean. Swint. Yes. yes. Richard Swint. Richard. I couldn't think of his first name. Right. Is he still in Paris? Yes. Yes. And he, 
he and his family were Methodists. I guess maybe his wife was a lovely wife. But I don't I don't know where they go to church now. But he, he did grow up in that church. So I think he's yes. about the same age as the Robinson twins. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Bobby Walters at the college, I think, was his uh, was was also his age. But we really had some remarkable people then. You remember Frances Sperry. She had Oh yes. She was a wonderful thing. And she Phoebe was, Rhodes. Yes. Phoebe is still doing well and Ray is still working as a pharmacist. I mean he's been a pharmacist fifty years and I see him about three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're still doing fine and their son uh, Rusty is in P V and he's in Florida. Oh P V person, new or P V color person. Uh, Estelle Mackey is still there and uh, very frail, but I see her almost every Sunday. And are there girls there? Uh, the older one is, Martha. Uh, Kathy lives in uh, Munster, I believe, or St. Joe, out west of Gainesville. But Kathy, I mean, Martha hmm. lives there in Paris. Her husband was a, uh, is a retired veterinary Don Smith. And, uh, oh, let me see. Will Taylor's passed away about a year, oh. about six or eight months ago, maybe closer to a year. We lost and Virginia is, is still living? Yes, she's had uh, knee surgery, has been in the hospital for about three weeks, but she, uh, I see her at the beauty shop almost weekly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had lost some real founders of the faith, uh, some real people that yeah. were just so faithful uh, over a period of number of years, of about two years, we lost just a lot of really faithful ones. And uh, that was, but of course. Yeah, Jane Estes was one of those. Yes, we miss Jane. She was, I see Betty every once in a while. In fact, I saw Betty last week. They had a reception at St. Joseph uh, honoring the memories of eight doctors. And uh, she came in and brought her daddy because, of course, he and uh, Jane worked for, was it Dr. Dr. Barker. Dr. Barker, that they worked for for so many years. So I saw her just like that. And, uh, oh, goodness. Who else, Martha? And Margaret asked me about somebody else. <laughs> well, let me see if I could remember somebody else. Um, when you think you all have been gone for 45 years. 45 years. Well, and of course, Lorraine Conley yeah. was always so close, particularly to our two girls. Yeah. When, if we were going out of town, we could leave our girls with Lorraine. <laughs> she was such, bless her heart, yeah, she was a very special lady. Yes, and saw that I always had a new hat. Yes, yes back in the day. <laughs> when you had to wear a hat. Yes. But you put on your hat and gloves to go downtown, even. Yes, you sure do. You do it. Of course, people dress much more formally mm -hmm. then. Was our, well, I know the sanctuary wasn't air conditioned, but I don't guess anything else was then, was it? Maybe the offices? Do you remember anything the church did? Yes, yeah, I, th I think you had window air conditioners in the offices. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, well, it is, is there anything else that uh, you all can think of, of special memories? It seems like all your memories are really pleasant, and I'm so pleased because it was a, 
Yes, I hated to leave Paris. It was, uh, we were really happy in Paris. Well, everybody remembers you all with such fond memories, and I have instructions from so many people, you know, tell them hello yeah. from FBC Paris. And uh, in April <coughs> of 2004, we will have our sesquicentennial celebration. And so you, I think it's the last weekend in April. We'll put that on the calendar. Yes. We'd love to be there. Last weekend in April. <laughs> well, when you were there, uh, Dr. Alley, they, you had our 100th anniversary. That's right. 54. Do you all remember anything special you did then? Hmm. I don't. Oh, I don't think. I don't remember. I don't have any. Do you remember what? I don't I know we had some special observances, but I don't remember. I don't remember either. Has the church history been written? That was one thing our committee is supposed to do. Of course, we have very little prior to the fire of 1916 because almost everything was burned up that was at the church. So anything we have before then would have been something at somebody's house whose house was not burned. And of course, 1,100 houses and buildings burned, so so many people lost all of that. But we do, uh, do not have, a, we had hoped to write a church history, but I don't, I don't think our committee, our volunteer committee, is going to be able to write it. I think it would be something we would almost have to hire somebody to research and do. But I wish that, I wish we could do it, because that church is a, is a historic church. Yes, it particularly is. Particularly because of Dr. Buckner and then of the fact that it has been a, outstanding church in that area for so long and has been so mission-minded mm -hmm. and has had such outstanding pastors, particularly in the this century. So I would, I wish we could get a history written, but I don't. Mm -hmm. If you farm out chapters to a committee, it's going to be kind of hard to, you know, to, to write a, a, real, a real history. But this is what we wanted, why we wanted to do some videotaping of people who were who were there, and of course, both the Revises are gone, so we won't, won't be able to get them on tape. And uh, Dr. White, of course, is gone, but we ha I think we have him on tape at a, at a uh, kind of a, not a retirement party, but a, what was it, John? The um, church finance group honored him. I, it was within, it was definitely within a year before he died. I think they were the last ones to live in the old parsonage. And then when the Revises came, they moved to the moved to that house mm -hmm. that was in John Crane's house. So, uh, but that you, when you all built that building, that was so far-sighted because, as I said, it it matched it. It's still up to code after 50 years. Or Isn't that <laughs> remarkable? Who was the builder on that? Oh, I, if you called it, I'd recognize. I think Miss O, he said. Was it Miss O Construction or uh, Harrison? Did it be Harrison? Maybe I don't know. I know remember J.W. Know. Harrison in the church. And, and also uh, Bill Fry, you know, yes. became a minister and was associate pastor. While James was there. I had forgotten that. Mm -hmm. And then he and uh, they moved to Sherman. No, they moved to Fort Worth and he went to seminary. Or did he have to finish college first, Margaret? I don't remember. I, I don't either. Um, Norma Fry, his wife, yeah. was in my Sunday school class. And I remember that they lived on the second floor in the funeral home. And she would tell me about having to keep her children quiet when there was a service going on downstairs. <laughs> yeah. uh, then they moved into a home, and she took a secretarial course, maybe before Bill went back to school, but I can't remember if he went to, to college or just to the seminary. Well, I know they moved to the Sherman area, and it seems like he was pastor at a town called South May, 
And Norma is always, she's really smart, but in not having the college, went to Sherman, to Austin College, and I think, of course, that's four years, but she got her degree. And then he died Bill young. Fred? He died young of oh. heart problems. And uh, I think maybe in his 40s. And his brother, Charlie, had worked for uh, TU Electric. And he and his wife moved back to Paris about 11 or 12 years ago when he mm. retired from T, T, well, TPNL, now TU TXU. And um, he is very active in our church. In fact, his wife was in my Sunday school class and she passed away of cancer about a year ago. And um, he has remarried. Dorothy Edzard. Do you remember Artist Edzard? Oh, yeah, yes. Well, Artist died two years ago in February, and he was, oh, we miss him so much. And um, his widow, Dorothy, and Charlie Fry got married in January. And uh, this Dorothy is also in my Sunday school class, so, and uh, we play dominoes with Dorothy and Charlie. Yeah. So that when you said Bill, it, yeah. uh, he's been gone for years, and I think it was hard that he died. But I had forgotten that he was. I knew he had surrendered to the ministry, but I'd forgotten that he acted as a uh, associate pastor there for a while to help out while he was uh, while he was yeah. Yeah. And your Sunday school class was named Vote of Vida, wasn't it? Yes. And the reason I hadn't that thought I hadn't Margaret? thought about that in a long how about time. That <laughs> and I remember that uh, that Norma Fry, who had taken. Latin in high school, as I had said. Now, if we really want to be correct, it should be Wodawita. <laughs> we learned in Latin. That's our big study. Yes. <laughs> so, I don't, there's a few things that stick in my mind. And I also remember one time that you had a famous Scottish preacher there, Dr. Jacob Barnhouse. Yes, what? Do you remember Scottish him? Scottish preacher. Scottish Presbyterian. Do you remember him, Margaret? Came for one Sunday. I don't remember him. I remember when we had, was it Charles Wells, who was kind of... Welburn. Uh, well, no, Wells, who, did, know, who did the cartoon. Yeah. He, and, and he was rather controversial. Well, he was, but he was basically good. Yeah, he was he would very good. He would draw as he spoke. I remember You remember that? A big white sheet on right. And he'd make marks. First thing you know, it looked like it yeah. was nothing. And then he'd make a few more, and it would... You suddenly see a cross with a figure on it or something like that. I remember that. I didn't remember he was a master at that. He was really good. Charles Welburn. No, not Welburn. Wasn't it? No, Charles Welburn, somebody else, a Baptist preacher. But this, I didn't remember it, but I remember that. Well, anyway, he was good. Nice to oh, visit with were, you. You were nice to come. Let us get you a cup of coffee. Uh, Would you drink a cup of coffee? Do you have decaf, Margaret? I do. If you, I hate to ask for that, but it has been a long day and I'm, I coffee. And you want to sleep. Morning. Yes. <laughs> Everybody can hear me. <laughs> now the red light's on. It's so good to be here in Houston today. And we're at the home of William and Lois Kendall. And they have the distinct honor of being children of two of our longtime honored pastors. William's father was pastor of First Baptist Church from, what were the dates, William? From July of 1907 to July of 1920, to April of 1922. So it was 15 years, just 15, almost. 15 years. And her father came in, in August of 22 okay. and was there until December of 37. So that was another 15 Another 15 years. Year. So years between the two of them, they were there for 30, 30, 30 years. They had a pastorate of 30 years, the two of them did. 
That is just wonderful. Um, what was your father's full name, William? W- w- William Bell Kendall. Now that's a B-E-L-L Bell. His some of his ancestors were named the last name was Bell, so that was a, he had the William Bell Kendall. I see. I have an, had an uncle here in Houston whose last name was Bell, and his parents had been missionaries in the Philippines. So it's a good Scottish name and a good Baptist. Name. <laughs> yes, it is. Do you remember when they were born? When your dad was born? Yes. A- Eighteen seventy-four. When did he pass away? In 1923. So not long after he left the church, he passed away. Is that right? Yes, it was just the next year or two after he left the church that he passed away. Didn't your mother come back to Paris and, and live as librarian at the junior college? They they had thought they had thought that my father would be an invalid, and they were building a house there on, on Houston Street for him and my mother to live in so he could live there for several years until he died. But he died in January of 23, and the, the house was only partially built. And so they decided to, they'd collected a good deal of money and they decided to go ahead and build a house and give it to my mother. The church did? The people, the yes. People, the people, the people the of the church. How wonderful. Yeah. And did, but didn't she work at the junior college or teach there? Or well, am I confused? that's another, that's a further along. I see. <clears throat> so when, when they got to building the little house, the little cottage for my mother. The people who were building it, Albright, you know, you know Albright, and he he was one of them. Of course, there were several businessmen in the church, like like Richard Albright. And he told my mother that if she could put another thousand dollars down, they could build her a two-story house, and she would have room to rent upstairs. If, 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 and with the cottage, she wouldn't have anything to rent. Right. So she put her, she had a thousand dollars, she had two thousand dollars. That was all the insurance my father had. <coughs> so she took one thousand dollars of that and put it on, and they built the to- house two-story, and they gave her the four four rooms upstairs, <coughs> and so shortly after she moved in, she rented those rooms. <coughs> and then the, that was the war time, so the soldiers were there in the camp. There's a camp there at, at Paris, a, a soldier camp, and this was. What, what year am I talking the about? The wartime came along a little bit later. First, she had school teachers there. All right. And the war was in the 40s. Yeah, so, so she did rent to them when the, when the war came along. But before that, she, I know that, that she had school teachers and different ones that had rooms there at her and house. And so the, the, the wives of the soldiers would come to Paris, and they couldn't con- Converse with it. the soldiers weren't allowed to t- tell anything of what they were doing, right. and but and they would rent a room for mother, and uh, well, she eventually made a little apartment or two up there, I think. And so yeah. I think some of the men li- they live with them. When did she pass away, William? Your mother. 1950. 1950. So she lived that much longer than your dad. Yeah. Well, they married in 98, and I can't, I don't know just when they, well, they married in 98, and mother was 19, and I think daddy was 24. He was five years older. But so, he, was, he was exactly the age of my father. They were both the same age. Well, and your father was born when? In 18, 
74. You want well, 94? Uh, no. Eight, 1874. He was born in I'm sorry. I was yeah. thinking marriage date. I'm sorry, William. 1874. Well, yeah. then he was born, and I guess if Daddy was the same age, I guess he was born the same time. I don't remember those dates, but I do remember that they were married, and I have their marriage license somewhere, so I know it's 1898. Okay. And, uh, Go ahead. So I don't really know. I don't know a lot of dates. I mean, I don't remember a lot of dates. They went to yeah. They went to they went to Dallas first. He had you know in those days. Now they allow pastors so much money to buy their own home. In those days, the church owned the parsonage, and the pastor lived there. And so of course, when they retired, they didn't have any place to go. So before he retired, he bought this four apartment house in Dallas, and uh, they were going there. And he was going to do some supplying. But he went from Paris to Shreveport. Oh, that's right, he did. Doctor Doctor Dodd was pastor at First Baptist Church of Shreveport, and he traveled a lot. And he and his wife were going on a three months trip, I think, about three months. And they wanted him to come there and live in their house and and be the interim pastor while he was gone. So that's what they did. First of all, they went there. That was the first three months. Yeah. And then they went. Then I went on to Dallas. Now I don't know how long they were in Dallas. Maybe a year. And uh, when the when I was that was thirty eight. So when the war came along in the early forties, uh, the pastor at Lancaster went to the with the army as a chaplain, and he just took a leave of absence. But while he was gone, he decided he wanted to continue being a chaplain. So he called back and resigned, and so then they called at his regular pastor. At, and he uh, stayed uh, at Lancaster. We lived at Lancaster four and a half years, William. My husband and I did back in the middle 50s. Did you? And were members of First Baptist, and of course they had so many fond memories of your dad. When did he pass away, Lois? Well, he was 80 years old. What year was it, Bill? Honey, my mother passed away in 50. Your mother passed away in 52. Your father passed away in 54. I guess that's true. So that's it. He knows the dates better than I do. Well, I, I never did know your father, of course, William, because he passed away in 23, and yeah. that was about eight years before I was born. <laughs> but I remember Dr. Wright so well, and yeah. he was a such a close friend of my granddaddy, Dewey's, and he married my mother and daddy, performed their ceremony, and I just remember so much about his um, his humor and his wit. And when I was a little girl growing up in Dallas, uh, he helped to start Park City's Lois. Do you remember that? He, he did what? Helped to start Park City's Baptist. Yeah. He came in from, uh, I think maybe he was still living in Dallas then before he now went this, to Lancaster. Yeah, that was before he went to Lancaster. Yes, when he first, I think when he first left Paris, when they were living in Dallas there. He did a lot of visiting for Park Cities yes. and got and getting it started and organizing. And see, when Mother was at the organizational meeting in fall of 39. Oh, was and she? And oh, she and I were charter members. Oh, were you? So that's, and I knew him in Dallas, you see, in addition to remembering him when I would visit in Paris, I also knew him in Dallas through the uh -huh. Park Cities connection. Yeah. Well, uh, what is your earliest remembrance, Lois, of of FBC Paris. How old were you when y'all moved there? To Paris? I was 14. So you were in high school then? I was in high school. And we had moved there from Oklahoma. And uh, in Oklahoma, they had 12 grades. And at that time, Texas had 11 grades. And so, was it Wooten that was? Superintendent. Superintendent uh -huh. there. Wooten. So he insisted that uh, whatever grade I was in, I was supposed to go back a grade. And what I actually did was repeat that grade that I had just done in Oklahoma. We read the same books in English. I took sewing and I made the same garments that I had made the year before. And so anyway, that he didn't want, to, he didn't want me to graduate ahead of what I would have done Mercy. in McAllister. But anyway, so that's... Uh, 
And then at that time, uh, so far as I know, you know, later on people moved around a lot. <coughs> they, do, <coughs> they do now, but at that time, the son of the Chamber of Commerce manager and I were the only people that weren't born in Paris. <laughs> And so, so uh, I didn't feel very welcome. Oh, I did in the church, but not, but not in, in school. Tell us about the church. They were just the sanctuary at that time. They had not built the educational building. Where did you go to Sunday school? Seems to me like we went to Sunday school in the basement. Okay. But I can't remember. Seems like the classes were in the basement. Was the parsonage right next door, just south right. of the church, that two-story house? Right next door. See, Bill's yes. father had built that after the fire. Right. And so, uh, and I can't remember. I can't remember a lot about. It. There was a vacant lot between our house and the church, mm -hmm. and I remember that. And I don't remember a lot about the church. Of course, I was, at that time. The church staff usually consisted, I've been reading this history that uh, Marie, somebody has yes. written. Uh -huh. uh, and they, they did have educational directors in there. But what I remember is that, that Daddy and the custodian, one man, and then a church secretary was just about the staff. And then they did from time to time. They had educational directors there. So. Who led the music, Lois? Thetis Williams. She played the organ and led the choir, too. She did it all. And you know, I think she is still alive. She's over is 100. She? Oh. And totally deaf. Is but she? It's been about a year since I've seen her. Well, William, I know the fire occurred when you were in Paris. Mother yeah. has vivid memories of the fire. Do you remember the fire? Yes. and. Your, your mother. It was 1916. Yeah, 1916. Yes. I'm trying to think of the house they were living in. Yes. You know the house on Lamar yes. Avenue? That uh -huh. they, well, my father built that house, and I don't know how your, your parents acquired it. But anyway, he owned that house when the fire came and didn't get out there. That's right. Your, your, your father owned the house when the fire came. And the fire didn't get out that far. <laughs> well, I know that the church burned. And was where was the parsonage that was burned? Was it where the new one came back? It was the parsonage was next door to the uh, church. And my my father, I don't know, he got he got around and he did a lot of things. And part of it was building. I don't know what what he did about it. Whether he just had People hired people to build a house, but he moved that. I imagine he moved a little parsonage a little, off of the property. They did that a lot, yes, sir. and uh, so then, then that, then he built a two-story house on the on that property before the fire. You see, that was that was before the fire, yes, sir. and then when the fire when the fire started down there in the southwest corner of the city right. and started up and, and we knew it was coming. Well, then my mother went upstairs and put things, put things in a, a sheet. sheet, three sheets. And she had some linens and she had some silver. She had a lot of silver. Silver, all right. Put that in the car and we had them there was a man there, a colored man who drove our car. And so she found him. He came, he showed up. Said, take the car and go out to the edge of town where there's no fire and just sit there with the car. Well, he, he took the car to his friend's house and they unlo unloaded all that and stole a good deal of that stuff. Oh, my goodness. So, that, that's that's what happened. Now let's don't dwell much on that. That that was. But after the fire, where did you live? Well, with my aunt had, was living in Terrell, and that was on this little railroad. Right. So we went down and stayed a week with Aunt True, and she she, she had a new baby, and it wasn't very convenient for anything. 
But then my father built a, a shack on the back of the, the, the past part in the lot. And uh, we lived in that shack until he built a two-story garage. <coughs> and a two-story garage would be 12 feet wide and 24 feet deep for the car. Right. And so, that, and they had two rooms upstairs and one room downstairs. In other words, two 12 by 12 rooms upstairs. And that's where we slept. And we had downstairs for eating and cooking and all that. And that's what my father did, and he, he did that pretty quickly. And did you have electricity and running water in there, William? Yes. You had, you had the utilities yes. were back on then after the fire. They yes, that the was. Now then, let me get around to the, the thing that my father did that I do not know whether you know about or not. But there was a man there that made hot tamales. Who was it? Who made the hot tamales? I can't think of his name, but he came up to the square every afternoon. And, we and he, made hot, hot he made hot tamales and brought them up to the square every day and sold three or four dozen hot tamales to the people that took them home and had the hot tamales. And so my father had every summer, he had watermelon and hot tamales as a combination. And so everybody would get, go buy the hot tamales. He would make extra hot tamales. And he would buy them from this man. Sugar Fox, I can't think of his name. Is. And oh, so, I, mine, what so comes to my mind is Henry, but brought, I don't think so. Brought it over to the, the space between the church and the Parsons, and that was a long there, and so they they would bring the hot tamales, and w my father would furnish the watermelon, and they would have watermelon and hot tamales for all day, all afternoon. So I never had heard that tale before. And people would pay for them, and they put the money in the church budget, or what? No, there was no no money took no money. Change hands. All right, but that's what he did. One one day every summer, he had watermelon and hot tamales, and people would buy their own hot tamales and bring them there. And he furnished the, the watermelon. And he furnished the watermelon. Now that was, that just took a one, one. That was one item that he did. But he he was he did a good he did a good many things like that. Now, to show concern for the now, let's get back to what I want to get back to, Lord. The fire. Yes, sir. <laughs> the fire was in 1916, and I don't remember, was it March 15th, Lord? What? <laughs> 23rd, wasn't it? March 23rd? I don't know. I just knew it was 1916. Latter part of March. Okay. Now, don't, let me, don't let me forget what I'm trying to. Tell you, tell you about, tell you about, <laughs> because. Was it about the people bringing their clothes to the church? Yeah. Yes, that, that was. Because they thought the church wouldn't burn, and then the church burned and burned up the stuff it, they brought there. Oh, a lot of people bought, bought clothes and things, things, valuable pictures of things, and put them in the church, because they knew that this big church wouldn't burn. And so the fire came along and burned the, burned the church. And then after, then, all right, I don't want to lose my, Train of thought. lose my way, way, but all that, that pace across the, all the houses were burned all the way up to, on our side of the street and the other side of the street and several blocks. The, the, the fire just burned up. So after the fire, <coughs> my father had always had tent meetings in different parts of the town. He had a tent, and he would put the tent up for three weeks and preach there, and people would come, and he'd move the tent to another corner. So when the fire burned, when the church burned down, and all this, he had this tent that he used at different places. He 
you put the tent up across the street, across the street from the parsonage, from the church, on, on that vacant lot there, and put sawdust down on the, on, underneath to keep it from getting wet. And so he must have taken a year to build a church. So he must have, we must have been over there a year. I know that, I don't know, I was cold that, that night I was baptized I was over there and I was cold. So I, I don't know, I guess it was that same spring. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, and, and they worship there for six months or uh, more. <coughs> and then, after they built the new church and moved over, took the way the tent and the, and the that, that benches, yes. the benches, and then they burned the sawdust. He put sawdust down on the floor, so it was time to burn the sawdust. And after he burned the sawdust, the nickels and dimes and quarters would show up in the, in the, under the sodas, and that's why we, we got some money that way. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, all right. Well, now, where, when was your home? At, you lived in the garage apartment then until he built the parsonage. When did they build that two-story parsonage? Well, you see, they already built one. Yes, sir. And it burned. Right. So they just built another one. And he it, it didn't have... <laughs> As I say, I don't know how my father got people to build these things. I know that he didn't pay them, <laughs> that he got a lot of free <coughs> free labor, free labor. And so he he had columns in the first house he built, big big white columns that went two stories high. And that all burned up, and he couldn't get, he couldn't repeat that. He had to build brick. He had brick columns, just four, you know, two, two on each side or something. <coughs> so that, that was what they. I don't think they, the columns went all the way up. It seems to be <coughs> they went part way up. I was thinking they just went one story, but I don't remember. For yeah, sure. I don't think they went all the way up. But so, I, okay, now did I tell everything? Oh, that's what yeah. now. I Yeah. And well, when did, I know you said that he had to resign in 1922 because of his health. Had he been sick long when he resigned or? Uh, uh, two or three years. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't remember him being sick when, when in uh, 12, 1912 to 1918. I don't, I don't remember him being sick. But before he got, got in bad health in another two years. He was sick in another two years, I would say. And then, he, then they decided, oh, they, I want to tell this quickly. A church called him in 1920, Cisco. <laughs> and so he was packing up to go to Cisco and the people in the church said, if you're just going to another church, we'll keep you here. <laughs> and so they, do, they wouldn't let him go to the, that. So it was two years later that he went to Belton. He had, a, he had a very good friend who was a superintendent of the Baylor Girls School. Yes, sir. And he, he got the church to call my father to the First Baptist Church at Belton. And that's where he, he was, and he couldn't walk at that time, so he had a, he was in a wheelchair. And he, <coughs> he would roll up and preach his sermon from a wheel, wheelchair. And build, he wanted to build this pulpit. Maybe he'd stand up when he got to the pulpit. All right, build a pulpit with a wide, pulpit that to hide his legs. Okay. So that's what he did for three or four months. 
And then he came back to Paris where, where he resigned from Belton and came back to Paris. And then my uncle Emmett Reed married his sister, my, my Aunt Margaret, and they lived in Baltimore. So he wanted my father to come to the hospital. Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins. And so he came down, and it seemed to me he made two trips up there, one in, 20, one in 1920 and one in 1922. And, the, and so in 1922, he went up there and he, didn't, he, died, he died there. I didn't know he died in yeah, he died out. He was 49 years old. And so I, I remember being on. He was in the. Where did they put bodies when they're home and on, on on a train? They put them on a car. They put them on a car. They put them in the in the car. Yeah, in the mail car, or some car, baggage car. All right, so then I was, my mother and I came back on the same train. <coughs> and so we got him out at, at Paris and he was buried in the cemetery. Surely he was buried. The church had a cemetery lot that they gave to us, him, and that's where he was buried. And then my mother, I was 1923, 1950, my mother was had was buried there, and then Kitty Kitty was there. Yeah, well, that was later on. That was. Well, now you finished was, high school then in 1923, didn't you? Uh, yes, I just barely got through by the skin of my teeth. I don't. I I hate to think of how near I came to not graduating, because Miss John, Miss A. Dean Johns, was a English teacher, and she didn't think I knew any English, so she was almost not going to fuck me, but somebody talked her out of it. So I was I graduated in 22, in 22. 23. No, 22. I graduated in 22 because but you graduated when we came. No, yeah, you're sugar. Not, you were not you're, in high school that next year. That's right. I, I graduated in May of 1922, and then I drove the car to Belton, where he was. I, I was only what, how old was I in 22? Six, sixteen. All right, sixteen. That's old enough. So I drove the car to Belton. Okay. Did he have a church secretary? Did they have a music director? Were there any other staff members? Uh, what, what was Miss Yancey? What was Miss Yancey? Well, I don't think she came along till later, did she? Yes. Was oh, she your daddy's secretary? Oh, yes, she was. Miss Yancey was there for years. I, I think Miss Yancey was a, was a was secretary, secretary and, and everything. Did they have a layman to lead the music? A, a layman, just a member of the congregation, would lead the music. W. T. Guthrie was a singer, and I'm sure he was. Did you say that that this woman was a? Thetis Williams. When I, as I remember, Thetis Williams was director of the choir. Now I don't. She couldn't play the organ and lead the congregation too, but she she was director that, of the that, choir. W. T. Guthrie had a good voice, and he was a singer. And so I know that he had something to do with the music of the church. Did you all have a Sunday afternoon youth group like BYPU when you were growing up, or did that come later? I, I believe it, some of it came in there. And, and I, I remember going, but I didn't pay much attention to what I was doing. Right. Well, the church was just beautiful. Sanctuary was beautiful that your daddy built. It was such a beautiful 
Well, Lois, when you moved to Paris, now your sister, Alpha, had just graduated from high school. Is that right? No. When we went to McAllister, Oklahoma, three years before, she had just graduated from high school. Oh, See, right. she's seven years older oh, than I am. seven years older. And so she went to Washtenaw College because we were in Arkansas right. then. That she went to Washtenaw that first year. And then we were moving to Oklahoma about the same time she went to Washtenaw. And so we got her off, and then we moved to McAllister. And um, then uh, funds were kind of scarce, and they didn't pay preachers a great deal. And so Daddy heard about Oklahoma College for Women, which tuition was much less. And so then the next year, the next two years, she went to Oklahoma College for Women. Where was it, Lois? Do you know? I, I want to say Oak, Oak Mulgee or Chickasha. Chickasha. I have a granddaughter who's a senior this year at Oklahoma Baptist in Shawnee, but I have not Shawnee. heard of Oklahoma College for Women. Well, I don't know what it is now, around. but anyway, it was a state. It was a state school. I and, uh, oh, a state school, sure. It was a state a school. school. No, it was sure. not a Baptist school. It was a state, state school. Because, right. see, the state paid for the, you didn't have right. tuition then. Right. So, um, anyway, she just thoroughly enjoyed that for two years. And then by that time, we moved to, we only lived in McAllister three years. And see, she was in Washtenaw that first year we were there. And then she was in OCW those next two day, years. And then we moved to Paris. And then uh, she came to Baylor then that last year to finish at Baylor. Well, Mother has told me that many times. Her mind is like a steel trap about things that happened a long time ago, you know, and she's told me that Alpha was three years ahead of her and that uh, Bill was a year younger than she, though I think they graduated together. That's why I thought he graduated in 23, because Mother graduated in 22, and I knew Bill was a, William was a year younger than Mother. <coughs> and um, she said that uh, she remembers that when my granddaddy took her to Belton to enroll in uh, Mary Hart and Baylor, Mary which was in Baylor College, that they visited your parents there in Belton. That's how I knew they had been in Belton a short while. Yeah. Because she said they visited them in the fall of 1922 when she enrolled in Baylor College. Mm -hmm. And then, well, now you moved into the parsonage, the two-story parsonage that, yeah. of course, was there. And do you remember, did they have any temporary buildings around the church? Uh, of course, it was just the sanctuary then. I don't, well, of course, with the basement. The basement, right. we must have had a, done an awful lot of things in the basement right. because the basement is very familiar to me. Of course, the sanctuary for worship services. Right. But um, I, the basement was there. And I remember there was an entrance from our house across here, and then the steps went down to the basement. So I must have, I must have gone down there to go to Sunday school, because that seems to me like Sunday school rooms were down there, and and then later on BYPU, and we did a lot of things in the basement. So that must have been our educational building in the basement. Well, now your daddy built a four-story educational. That building was back of the church during the depression, and I've often wondered how that in the was, world you did that. Well, that was later on. I've been I've been reading this. Uh, book and this I found that very interesting that a lot of things and you know we uh, this may not have anything to do with the church but the well it does too but you know we're in a Buckner yes. enterprise here and uh, I was interested to see that Dr. Buckner was pastor at First Baptist Church at the time he had the idea for Buckner Orphan's Home. And my granddaddy Ratliff was one of the men that Dollar put that dollar in. in. <laughs> well, this was 77, and this story on the wall. Oh, I, I remember you, the Ratliff name. Yes, sir. That well, was sure my you mother's did. granddaddy. Yeah. And he was one of those that put the dollar in. Yeah. And we have a historic marker on our property for Dr. Buckner. Do you? Yes, ma'am. We sure do. Well, I thought that was real interesting. Yeah, that's that something. He said, we're talking about this. Let's get it started. So he got put out a dollar, and everybody else put in a dollar. So they raised $27. And then I noticed this, uh, there's a whole write-up on the wall down here of telling the whole history of the Buckner things, that the orphanage was established in 79. He said it should be in North Texas, and they established it in Dallas. But anyway, I just thought it was interesting. But that you need to tell him it really started in Paris, Texas. It really started in Paris, Texas. He had the idea. The idea was born in Paris. That's right. So now we've got all this widespread 
uh, you can't really call it Buckner benevolence. It's not all benevolence. <laughs> a lot of it is, but it has really grown. Well, we've, I did not know this until a year ago, but the reason Dr. Buckner came to Paris in the first place is that his friend, General Sam Bell Maxey, had moved from Kentucky to Paris before the Civil War. And oh. he got Dr. Buckner to move to Paris. I did not know that until I was at an affair at the Maxey House, and they recreated Dr. I mean General Maxey's funeral, and uh, General I mean Dr. Buckner gave the funeral oration at General Maxey's funeral, and they had a man portraying Dr. Buckner reading the actual oration, oh. <laughs> and that's when I found out that it was Sam Bell Maxey who had gotten Dr. Buckner to come to Paris before the war. Yeah. And that's something to smile at. I but think that's real interesting that Paris is, First Baptist Church of Paris has been there a long time. Yes, it has so much history. It really well, does. Can you remember about how many were in Sunday school and church when you were there, Lois? I sure can't remember anything about it. I remember that while I was still there, and when I was not much older than when I first went there, that I started teaching in the beginner department. Yeah. And I was teaching four-year-olds. And I guess that was also in the church basement. That was in the basement. <laughs> I guess they, they must have had, you know, they didn't have any other place for Sunday school rooms. Unless they had some temporary buildings. They didn't have temporary buildings. I don't remember any temporary buildings. Well, I think it's just absolutely amazing that they were able to build a four-story educational building during the Depression and pay for it. <laughs> that was your dad's dream. I'm sure it was built during his, his past. Well, I remember when he had the idea of building that, and that, you know, that... Uh, uh, educational building back there was not built to match the church very much. It was a, I think it was red brick and the church was kind of a tan brick. I don't know, but anyway, he did do that. But that, you see that, I guess they had outgrown all the, yes. and it was one of, one of his specialties was paying off a mortgage and raising money. So uh, Dick, our son, said he ran into somebody, and I don't know who it was the other day that was a member at Paris, and he said, uh, Dr. Wright was one of the best pastors we had, but not one of the best preachers. Well, I don't remember that. I do <laughs> remember his poetry, his humor, and Lois, when I, was, what... when I was in high school, and I graduated from Paris High School in 1948, it seems that your mother and dad had moved back to Paris then to retire. Probably, so, yes, I'm came sure they had. And he spoke at our school. We used to have pastors come once a month to yeah. the school. Of course, you couldn't do that now. <laughs> you bring right. in guns and you can do all sorts of evil things in the school, but you can't bring pastors in. But then we'd have a pastor come once a month. And, of course, he was older, and this was a group of teenagers, but he had them in the palm of his hand with his humor. And he got up, you know, and he says, I'm you know, pastor emeritus. And he says, what does that mean? It means good old has-been. <laughs> and, you know, of course, everybody laughed. And then he had his jokes and his humor. And, of course, his points of, of you know, the other He was a good after-dinner speaker, he and he was wonderful. But you see why, why they said, why somebody would say that, that he was a good pastor. He was a good pastor because I was just telling Bill, he visited businesses in the morning. In the afternoon, he visited homes, but he would, mother had to go with him. He would not go to a home where there was a lone woman right. without taking mother. Right. He was very particular <laughs> about uh, all of that, and so they went visiting every afternoon, and then nearly every afternoon, I'd come home from school, and they were not there, and then mother would come in late, and she'd often go to, straight to the kitchen with her hat still on <laughs> while she fixed dinner, but anyway, so, so he was, he was, and you know, they said that, that he first came down there and talked to the Lions Club, and they said, well, if the First Baptist Church doesn't call you, we will, because he was that kind of a speaker, and he he loved to memorize poetry. See, he was one of, he was one of the last self-taught preachers. He couldn't get a church anywhere today because with that, with as little education as he had. But he was self-taught. He loved to memorize poetry and he loved to, uh, and he did have a good sense of humor. And he would start a, a talk and and then bring it up to something, you know, start with jokes, and then he'd bring it up to the real point. So anyway, but... Uh, well, he 
he certainly grew that church and grew that building. I'm, I'm still amazed at that building being built during the Depression when so many people... Lois Wright, Alpha and Lois Wright. And of course, I knew Dr. Wright and Ms. Wright from the time in yeah. Park Cities, in addition to visiting Paris when he was pastor here. I said, all my life I've been going back and forth between Paris and Dallas. But I remember asking my mother, well, since when I finally learned that Alpha meant, was the first letter of the Greek alphabet, I said, Mother, if the Wrights named their first daughter Alpha, why didn't they name their second daughter Omega? And Mother said, because they didn't know it would be their last daughter. That's, so, what, that's what Mother always said. <laughs> she said, we didn't know she was going to be the last. <laughs> I had wondered that, Bill. I sure have. Do you remember if there was a youth, was there an active youth group when you were growing up, Lois? Yes, there was. I guess that was a BYPU. Of course, it, later on it was a BTU. Right. And I noticed this woman calls it BTU when it was still BYPU. Right. But as I remember it, all the time that I was there at home, I don't know when it started, but it seems to me like it was there all the time I was in Paris. Did you have a Wednesday night prayer service? Was it in the sanctuary? I think the Wednesday night prayer service, because we didn't have... I guess we didn't have supper then. We had we had meals there once sometime. I don't know when we had meals, but we used to have prayer meeting every night, every Wednesday night. But I don't remember whether we had them. I don't. There was an auditorium down in the basement, mm -hmm. and I don't remember whether we had prayer meeting down there or upstairs. We have prayer meeting in the basement today. We do meet you? for supper and have prayer meeting around the table. Well, we do it South Main. In the bottom of the yeah. of the original building. We sure mm -hmm. do. And uh, we're still getting water in it, too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, do you, uh, tell me about how you all dressed when you went to church. How we dressed? Yes. Very formally, I guess. I guess we dressed up. <laughs> We've all, as far back as I can remember, we dress up on Sunday. Yes. Means now that I wear a dress. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, back there we didn't wear anything but dresses. That's but right. Anyway, we always dressed up on Sunday. And you've commented about your daddy and what, visiting, and what a, he was such a wonderful pastor. I'm sorry that I don't know William's father, but I do know what a wonderful pastor Dr. Wright was. But all this visiting and this personal contact yeah. with the people. That was so special. That was his, that was his specialty. Right. And involving the people and letting them know that they were loved. Yeah. That, um, did, you, uh, did you have a lot of emphasis on missions in the church then? Do you remember? We had these missions organizations as far as back as I can remember growing up. First I went to Sunbeam Band, and then I went to GAs. Right. And, uh, of course, we had, we had GAs in uh, Paris. So we had the mission organizations way back there. Wow. And of course we had the, way back I remember Ladies Aid, maybe by the time it got to, time we got to Paris, maybe it was Women's Missionary Union, I don't know. Do, do you of remember course, how you, I'm sorry, come on. Well, that's, what do you want to ask me? A while ago we were, started talking about how they raised money. Uh, do you remember if you had pledge cards for the budget or anything like that? I don't think so. But I don't remember anything like that. That probably came along later. Did they have envelopes then for the Sunday offering, or do you remember? Surely we did. When did we have the, uh, the was it the nine-point system? Oh, I don't know when. Oh, present on-time Bible broadcast. Yeah, Bible, mm -hmm. daily Bible reading yeah. and all that. I don't know when that started, but that's... Uh, but, um, about the, the music, did, uh, was there always a choir? Did you always have a choir on Sunday morning? Yes, we was always Was there have. a youth choir on Sunday evenings, or do you? I don't remember much about youth choir. I don't, if we had a youth choir, I would have been in a youth choir because I love to sing. I never could sing, but I love to sing. And I would have been in a youth choir, and I don't remember ever being in a youth choir. So I don't remember that, but we always had a choir. Right. Even way back in 
Camden, we had a choir always, so there was always a choir and an organist. And of course, they used to, and I don't know whether they did that in Paris or not, whether they had electric electricity by the time they used to have somebody in the back had to pump the bellows to right. the make an organ, but I don't know whether that had to do with Paris or not. They, when the new sanctuary was built, William, that your dad built, um, they, did they put a pipe organ in when it was built? Do you remember? Um, I don't guess I remember. But it seemed to me that my mother had something to do with the, with the pipe organ. Yes, sir. Uh, she received some money from her father about that time, and I think they put some of it in into the organ. I see. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know. That, that's just... Hazy. Right. <clears throat> and, well, it sounds like that there was a really good spirit in the church during those years. The people coming together after the fire and, and rebuilding like they did. And uh, it just sounds like, and of course then during the Depression, which was, which was a terrible time, it seemed like the people just really had a good spirit there in the church. I don't remember anything otherwise. Isn't that wonderful? That is so, wonderful. I, I know they're telling this history here about a church splitting, but it was way back there. Oh, yeah, before the turn of the century. Let, before the turn of the last century. Was it? <laughs> let, let me say something I remember about the houses burning down. Yes, sir. And they wondered if the insurance companies would stand up and pay off. And the answer was that they did. The insurance companies paid off every house that was burned. They, they paid off some, somehow. I don't know who paid off, but anyway, they, they didn't have any trouble collecting insurance when it, for the burned houses. And of course, the church would have been insured. And um, the parsonage, too, I'm sure. I'm sure they were. <laughs> my mother telling many times her daddy you know had a had an insurance agency in what is now what's well, the Scott building on the northeast corner of the plaza and mother said she remembers his going up there when he realized that the fire was coming to the plaza and of course by that time the electricity was up and that he ran up the stairs to his office because the elevator was out and got his files because he knew that the people would be making claims, you know. So he got all those files and carried them out on Lamar Road to his parents' home. Oh, so they so, had them. So he would have that the records great. of his uh, of the people that mm -hmm. had their policies with him. And that uh, then I guess he went to Austin in when nineteen. He was as fire insurance right, commissioner. State commissioner. I, uh -huh. Yeah, fire. They used to. I don't think it's divided like fire insurance and life insurance no, now. It's just one. I yeah, but he was fire insurance commissioner because the life insurance commissioner was uh, downstairs. I believe was, I believe we were upstairs. But I remember that he was fire insurance yes. commissioner then. Uh, wow. Well, well, what? I, you both seem to have lots of fond memories of Paris and of Paris people. Uh, oh, I want to ask you about Vacation Bible School, Lois. Did you work in Vacation Bible School or did they have it then? I don't think we had Vacation Bible School. I don't remember Vacation Bible School in Paris at all. It may have started later. I don't remember when it started. I don't remember it when I was there because I probably would have worked yes. in it if it had been Vacation sure Bible since, especially since I worked in the beginner's department. Well, do you remember revivals? How often did they have revivals? Oh, we had revivals. I don't know how often we had them. I'm sure we had them every year, and maybe more but, often. I don't know. But I, I can't think of anything. Who was the man who, who held the revival, who came every year and held the revival? The same one. Huh? We didn't always have the same one. <coughs> but I, I think I know who you're talking about, but I can't think of his name either. That's too bad. But there were several. They all usually brought somebody in. Mm -hmm. Uh, evangelist to, and they had the and I remember even even when my father was there we had the tent across the street sometime mm -hmm. and had it for a revival meeting right. Right. particularly in the 
summers. Yeah, it'd be in the summer. Uh, that church has been such a blessing to so many others for so long. Were there any missions started throughout the city from our church when, that you remember when your dad was Pastor William? Yeah, I ran across that in the history. Nothing, we don't remember, remember it, but the book says it, says it was. I see. Ramser Baptist started, I know, from our church. I don't know what date it was, but when Dr. Revis was there in the 40s, four others were started, and then when Dr. Riley was there, one other was started. So I remember five starting, and uh, I didn't know if... It uh, seems like I've heard Roy Welch say that Emmanuel Baptist, which is in West Paris, started as a mission of our church. Too. West Paris is what I'm thinking about that I read in this history. So it was, yeah, I learned some things in this history that I didn't know about. Right. It's, a, it's a chapter on... Bill's dad and a chapter on my dad, and so I think uh, I don't remember Daddy starting any, and I think it's in that history that Bill's father did. But uh, there was one out there. I don't know whether it was already started or not, but but I know Daddy used to go out there and preach sometime, and I can't. East Paris would it have been East Paris. It wasn't the one in West Paris. I don't know. There was a, I, I think it was named for Ms. Ramser in our church that gave maybe yeah. gave the land for it or something. Yeah, Ms. Ramser. I remember they used to call Daddy from Dallas. Would you go see Ms. Ramser and ask her for some money for something? He, he always hated to do that because he he was called on to do it so often. Of course, she was so good about giving money. I don't guess I ever knew knew about her. Lord. I'm sure you didn't know Ms. Ramser. Don't but remember. But she lived right there, you know, you know where they built the house for Bill's mother on Houston? East Houston, East Houston. Well, she was right back of that. Ms. Ramser gave the lot. But she was, she was on Lamar Avenue. Yeah, on, the, on this street. And then, but she, that lot was right behind her house, and she gave that lot. It faced East Houston, but it was right yeah. behind her house on Lamar. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of people were very generous with their time and with their love. I have a daughter and son-in-law who are pastor's wife and pastor. One of our, our youngest child husband is a pastor, and they're, he's a Southern Baptist pastor in Kansas, where Southern Baptists are not in the majority. Yeah. So I, I, I've, I've not been a pastor's child, but I kind of can see a few things from a pastor's family point of view. It sounds like there were a lot of advantages in growing up at the pastor's home, besides some disadvantages of having to move. Yeah. Oh, there definitely were a lot of advantages. There were a lot of advantages in growing up in a good Christian home. Yes. Well, well I, re I remember that we went to church every time, every Sunday. Right. We couldn't stay home and pay, pay sick or pay anything. Right. Well, the subject never came up. Right. <laughs> it, was, it was understood that you went to church when the church doors were open. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I remember one thing about, of course, in those days we didn't lock doors. Uh -huh. But I know that the, the choir, the special music used to come to our house and practice. And, uh, and the different things, the committees would come over there while the church was going on, you know, when maybe during Sunday school or between Sunday school and church, they'd come over to the, the parsonage because that was private. And, they, and, of course, the doors were open all the time. You could come and go, and there was a piano there, and they could come and practice the music. That was, of course, there were a lot of advantages for Parsonage to be next door, and there are a lot of advantages now to pastors owning their own homes where they want them. Things change. Yes, they do. Well, do you have, uh, I think we've pretty much, y'all have just been wonderful to talk to. Yeah. And you've told me so many neat things that I did not know and uh, I'm anxious to share with Mother when I get home uh, because she has so many fond memories of you two and she just talks about you so much. 
Oh. Now, she, she was in our church, but your father was not. That's right. He, he was in the Christian church. First Christian church. So, he, I remember. He became a Baptist in the 50s, and James Riley baptized him. Did he? I never did hear that he did. <coughs> he finally came to the Baptist church. Who baptized, who baptized him? James Riley. Yeah. Who married Norman and me. Yes. Yeah. Well, I never did. I don't think I ever knew that he came to yes. the Baptist church. Well, he and he and Daddy were good friends in the Lions Club. Yes. And then, of course, my granddaddy and your daddy were such wonderful yes. friends. Now, my granddaddy never became a Baptist. This is my daddy I'm talking about, Lois. Oh. My daddy, John Williams, not my granddaddy. Yeah. My granddaddy and your daddy were such special, special friends. Yeah. And um, I remember my granddaddy saying what she said a while ago that if First Baptist Church didn't call uh, Dr. Wright to Paris that the Lions Club would because he was he had started the Lions Club in Paris. You know, my granddaddy had. Oh, had he? Yes. And it's a Founders Lions Club. It's one of, I think, three or four in the nation that's considered a Founders Club, and my granddaddy helped start it. But my daddy was also a Lion, and my granddaddy was mayor, and then later my daddy was mayor. So oh. they had a lot. And they, of course, my granddaddy not my daddy's daddy. My granddad we're talking about was my mother's dad. Mm -hmm. And the one that you all remember so fondly. Yeah, the one we know. Right. Jim Bell DeWeese. Right. Well, it, can you all think of anything else that you might remember that I haven't asked you about? I can't. I feel I like... I can't think of anything. You know, really, I was not there a long time. Right. I, because <coughs> I was there until I finished high school and then I went to Hardin-Simmons and then I... Uh, Came back and did go to junior college a year, and then I went to Baylor two years, and and then went to Austin a year, and then married, and so I wasn't there but just a few years. But of course, I was more or less connected with the church. But anyway, I think it's we appreciate you all coming. <laughs> well, it was just wonderful, Lois. I have been wanting to do this well ever since our historical committee was formed, not quite two years ago, about. Six months later, we started talking about interviewing people. And uh, I said, oh, I know we need to go to Houston and interview William and Lois Kendall. And I said, their pastors, their fathers spanned 30 years in the ministry here. And I said, they're good friends of my mother's. And I said, I want us to go. And we've uh, talked about it and talked about it. And so we just finally put feet to our, uh, to our words and got to come down and talk to you. And I'm so glad. Well, it certainly has been nice having you all here. You have, and you have just I'm, told us things that I'm we... I'm afraid we haven't helped very much. Oh, 